Hello CS25. In this video, I'm going to go over Unit 11 notes, which is Chapter 7 in your textbook. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about security. Um, security is broken down into two categories. There's physical and logical security. There's also administrative security, but the two primary areas are going to be your physical and your logical security. Um, in the physical security, it's really looking at the actual equipment, um, how to really protect the systems physically, such as um, prevent thief from taking the systems, um, be able to put lock on doors, um, and protect your company assets and resources. So in physical security, we can implement a few strategies on how we would be able to protect these systems. We can have man trap in that we would have two locking doors. So as one enter one door, one would have to enter another door to go to the server room, for example. Um, you often see man trap being implemented in hotels and businesses. So that way it would prevent people from tailgating um, and reduce the risk in that people can enter doors without being authorized to do so. We can also use batch reader um, using photo ID and electronic uh, type of batches to access resources. So some, some batch would use barcodes, magnetic street, strip, and then um, now we do have system that will be able to do facial recognitions or using RFID. And with that, we want to be able to monitor who enters and leave the building. So that would give you a little bit of added security. Um, in using RFID, we would then use barcode batches or radio frequency identifier chip or tags to be able to track the movement um, of the actual individual or actually we're looking at objects um, like systems, we can use that to tag to see if that system leaves the facility and so on. For your smart card, um, smart card would then be like your credit card or your ID card. And smart card would then be used for identification along with accessing a certain type of applications. Um, in your credit card, this can be used or your debit card it can be used to access could be financial resources and also in hotels or other areas you would see that would be for room access or resource access and so on so contactless card or swipe based cards would then be used now we would see a lot of the um and the the near field the NFC being used where you can tap the card or have you if you hold the card near the reader, it will be able to do that instead of swiping it. So we can implement smart card, smart card reader, um, even to access the physical system, like the computer systems and rooms that will be um, allowing us to elevate the protection of our system. We can also integrate security guard, somebody that will be able to monitor who comes and goes, who leaves the building, um, the type of guests they would need to sign in. So we would have a log of who's entering, who's leaving the building at what time. And so we'll be able to manage, um, you know, and prevent some of the security risks. And door locks are very important. Um, electronic lock or the physical lock would prevent people from entering an authorized area. Um, Sometimes you would see facility would have fences or wall that would prevent people from entering a certain area of their building. Um, so, you know, signage and locks are crucial in, in the part of the physical security. Now, we also can also integrate biometrics lock that would be using fingerprints retina scan, facial recognition, etc., to really authenticate the user. And if the user is not permitted for that area, that will prevent them from entering. And some facility would use the token, which is an RFID token. 
and this can be activated or sometime it could be USB token or key fobs. Um, it would use an RFID reader or a USB reader or a key fob um, hardware with the, the RFID reader to be able to open doors, access systems, and so on. And I've seen um, integration where on the USB, it would generate a randomly access code and the user would have about 50 seconds in order to enter that in order to be able to access a certain area of the building or even logging into the computer. Now for laptop, um, laptop can be chained down to a certain desk using cable locks. Also the same thing with desktop. Um, we would also use cable ties and other things to be able to um, prevent that desktop from being removed from a certain workstation area. We can also integrate docking stations uh, with security slots. So that way we would be able to inventory the type of mobile devices that are docking and non-docking. We will be able to track. And some company would actually use um, virtual monitoring where you, know, you can remotely lock a certain system in the case that it is lost. Um, so there would be different type of services that you would use and you would see this with smartphones nowadays. So, and also important that we would do server locks on the actual rack because there are times that people would actually try to take an entire server. And so we would lock the rack, the, the rack doors, and we would then be able to implement things like biometrics lock, key locks, um, or key cards. And we would also need to put in security cameras in the facility so we can monitor. Then on the user system, we can add privacy screen to protect the privacy of the user. So that would reduce the cone vision about 30 degrees. So if somebody that walks by, they will not be able to see most of the screen unless they're standing at a certain angle. Um, and that would prevent a lot of the data from exiting or being seen by other individual. And it talks about key fobs um, and key fobs can be used and we can integrate code that will be randomly generated for 30 to 60 seconds and the code will be displayed on the actual fob so that way it would allow the authentication server to really validate the identity of the individual that's using that um, or the ownership of that particular fob. And like I mentioned before, a roster or a log of who's entering, who's leaving, and also checking the log of um, which system is being accessed at which time and which area is essential. Because no point in implementing all of these systems if we don't manage um, the actual log itself. Now, the second part of security is going to be the logical security. And the logical security is more on the configuration and the use of the system in a secure manner. So one way that we can integrate security with the user access is through access management control. And this would start with having a server to be able to control the users in the group, the group membership, and the policy that will be applied to the group and in Windows system we would use Active Directory. Active Directory is a database that we can integrate users, computers, and system on our network. We can create user accounts, group, uh, membership for those users. We can use policy or rules to apply to the larger groups and be able to control their privileges and permissions to the certain resources. So privileges would pertain to system tasks, such as shutting down a certain system, installing a certain application, where permission would pertain to your files and your drives and the folders that's on the system or on the network that is being shared. 
So now in the Active Directory, we can use login script. So when the user logs into the network, it would know that the user is um, using that system by running the login script. And what it does is it's going to look at the security um, information for that user account, what's given to that particular user account, and be able to provide the resources that's according to how the account is set up. So then, because the user belongs to a certain group, it would then be able to implement the group membership policy, the group policy to be able to control the resources for that user. So the login tasks could incorporate virus scan or to install printer drivers and so on. So we can launch these scripts and we can have them automatically launch at the login of the particular user. So that way the user would be able to print or the user would be able to see a certain icon on the desktop, um, such as drive mapping or to be able to scan virus automatically as that user logs in, especially for the mobile devices, that's really important. Then the second area would be domain and domain is just a, a network or a, a group of computer on the network that is under one administration. And normally you would have a domain controller, which is a server that's going to be in charge of the entities, the objects, um, the resources for, you know, for that particular network. And we can integrate Active Directory within the domain controller. So that way we can control the resources. As I mentioned before, we would use group policy, which is a set of rules and instructions to define by the user in the group. So that way they have the appropriate uh, privilege and permissions for the resources on the network. Then we can also establish what's called a home folder. And this is a folder that is accessible by administrator. Uh, where the users and the data would be kept so that way we can audit these type of files and folder uh, to see if there's any kind of potential risks and threats and to see if there's any fraudulent activities and so on. So home folders are also important um, in that it not only allow us to really manage the resource, the usage of our storage and our devices, it is also controlling the security area. And we can implement what's called a folder redirection. This allows the work to be done in what's called the organizational unit. It can be saved in a common folder on the network and it can be redirected to a certain area where it could be kept so that way we can archive certain type of files that will be shared by a group or a team um, or a number of users, um, such as like designs and uh, code and so on. So it would also allow us to maintain updates of, you know, the work status and the work performance for our company. So in that, we would then answer our questions. In number one, it asks you why is the physical security important in the organization? We can say that because physical security measures uh, the protection. Actually, the security provides protection of equipment, facility, access, and people safety. So we want to protect company assets, which are equipment, the facility, the building, the land, and the people the people who are operating the business. So physical security is going to do that. And physical security goes beyond locks and things like that. We would think about a uh, fire extinguisher, um, earthquake, um, earthquake retrofitting for our equipment so it doesn't hurt people in the case of there's earthquake. 
in the case of storms we would think about where we would be able to relocate the people and so on so it goes beyond just server rooms and door locks and cable locks for our computer but it's really about the protection of assets for the company which are people equipment and facility for number two um, it asks you to identify three or more physical security measures and you can refer to the notes to identify the things that you want to add for this so i just list a few things smart card system for door and computer access door locks to um, protect equipment, people, and control authorized areas, okay, and prevent the unauthorized people from coming into your facility, security guard to monitor guests and visitor, And then access token to access uh, systems, doors, facilities, and so on. And then laptop and cable lock to prevent thief, or I should say reduce the risk of uh, theft. And then key, fob key fobs is mainly to enter to authorize ac physical access to the facility and also key fobs we can use it to really generate uh, uh, we can monitor physical access because as they use it you would have um, the log of who's entering a certain area and leaving a certain area. For number three, when managing a domain using Active Directory, which features can be used to allow appropriate assigned resources to the users after login? We would use login script and group policy. We talked about we can use it to run a certain type of service with login script and group policy allows us to control privilege and permissions. So next, we're going to talk about um, software tokens. So software tokens can be used for accessing different areas of applications or different applications and web. Um, it can also integrate multi-factor authentication process, such as uh, something you know, something you do, something you are, and something you own or have. So a software token would be like your Google Authenticator. This allows you to integrate an API in the authentication process. Um, it reduces the process in that the user have to re-enter the username and password. They can use their username and password for Google to be able to use another type of service or another app. Um, so then when the user logs in, the app would then be able to run linking the authentication algorithm. So when that's generated sometime, it would require a text in that you would own a phone. So that will be something you have and that would give you the multi-factor. So after you enter the username and password, it's still going to uh, ask you to text and when you receive the text you would enter a code um, or sometime it would generate an email link where because you have an ownership of your email you would then click it to be able to authenticate and validate that you are the user that's accessing the account so that will be your software token and um, the multi-factor authentication is more secure in that we want to elevate that so we want to really validate the user um, before we can authorize the user to access a certain resource like another application now mdm policies this is called mobile device management a policy 
This can be used with VMware AirWatch, Citrix Zen Mobile, or Soti Mobile Control. This allows the administrator to configure mobile devices in a centralized manner. So a good MDM software would secure, monitor, manage, and support a lot of different type of mobile devices. Um, and the prevalent ones are the Android and your iOS. And at an enterprise level, we want to utilize a type of management software that would be able to allow us to see the type of activities in these type of devices, what kind of resources they're using, um, or even on the bandwidth level, you would see that how it's being used on the wireless side of our, our network. So it mainly allows us to protect the systems, monitor the system, manage the system, and support it in, in different levels. In the protection of our system, we can configure our port security by disabling the ports that we don't use um, and allowing the firewall to block certain activity for that port because you might have attack coming in from a certain port so we want to be able to use a filtering system such as the firewall system. And firewall can be a physical appliance or a software, which is known as the application firewall, to be able to prevent a certain type of port connection through UDP or TCP or both. And because the port is normally tied to a protocol and a service, and certain application would use the type of protocol and service. <coughs> so, then you would be able to um, prevent a certain type of service from being utilized over the network or coming into your network. So we can use also the firewall, and you can do this on your, your wireless router to be able to filter your MAC address. And again, we call it MAC stands for Media Access Controller Address. This is a physical address that you would see on your system. Um, this will be ingrained onto the network adapter. And your MAC address, um, we can use it to allow a certain system to be connecting and this allow a certain system from connecting so we can add the MAC address to the list of allow and that will allow the system to access and we can add the MAC address to the disallow or the deny list and that will be your access control list um, so now this can be done in a network um, for all the appliances in the system, it doesn't have to be a computer. You can do that for switches, routers, um, or overall any kind of system. So someone can walk by the switch and plug in the cable and connect the laptop to the switch. Number one, if we turn off the port on that switch, the empty port where nothing's connected, um, that would prevent that system from connecting. Second, if we filter the address for all our systems that are connecting, then it would prevent an, a foreign system or an external system from just connecting to our network that way. So MAC filtering is also very important. And um, we can also establish in, in encryption use, a lot of times you would need to have a certificate and applications would require certificates. And sometimes apps would hold viruses or bugs that can cause problem on the network. So what we can do is we can make sure that we validate the type of app that would be reliable um, by approving the operating system and the vendor using certificate. So a digital certificate <coughs> is just a file that would be able to identify the type of permissions for that particular software to access a certain area or a certain part of the hardware. 
and utilize certain resources on the OS. So then <clears throat> we can use the certificate to be able to manage and track the type of applications that's being used. We can also disallow a certain type of system using the digital certificate. We can revoke the certificate and we can put an expiration on the certificate. So a lot of the web application that you use from the game that you play to uh, you know, the app that you use to check your bank account, a lot of them uses certificates, right? Certificates is allowing your the app to be able to use your camera, your microphone, and the resources on your phone, and it specify that when you install the app. So in a network environment, uh, we can enable a server that's going to distribute the certificate that would work accordingly to the application that we support. Anything beyond that, we would be able to disallow <clears throat> and control it through that way. So to really access Windows 10 Certificate Manager, you can use Cert Manager or Cert MRG, MGR MSC, <clears throat> and this would let you be able to see the certificate that will be for your Windows 10 system. We also would use anti-malware applications. This allows us to be able to, you know, identify if there is malware on our system and also block the type of malware that might be <coughs> entering our system. You can have Trend Micro, um, Norton, McAfee, and AVG and so on. There are many different type of free anti-malware that's available. Um, the difference between that and having a subscription to a certain anti-malware is that when you have the subscription, you do have additional features like VPNs, uh, you know, block websites, uh, cleaning up for some of the security settings and so on. And Anti-malware is important in all areas, in all types of systems, such as if you're using smartphones like iOS and Android. It does not mean that you, when you're using iOS, it would be uh, more secure or less secure. It's really how you use the system. So you would want to install anti-malware on your system regardless. And you need to really educate that to the user, especially the people who you help fixing the system because if they are prone to certain risks, likely that they will likely repeat the, the issues. So if we educate them, we will be able to reduce some of the, the future risks for that particular system. <clears throat> Here, it describes a firewall. This is a physical device or a software, like what we talk about, application firewall. We can have a, a firewall that's going to be one-way firewall that's going to be for everything that's coming in, your inbound threats. Or we can have a two-way firewall that's going to be protecting your network from uh, unauthorized inbound and outbound traffic. We can use an application like Zone Alarm, and most of your security application comes with software firewall. And we can permit a certain type of IP address, uh, block a certain type of traffic from the internet, uh, uh, different type of ports, different type of service, and so on. We can also use a proxy server with the firewall. And proxy server can be used to filter um, traffic coming in. We can specify on the server that it's only going to service this type of traffic from this originator or a certain source. Um, or a certain type of ports and so on. Physical firewall appliances can be uh, quickly analyzing the network and some of the firewall is very intuitive now where we it would look at the certain pattern. So anything that's outside of the regular specified rules and firewalls usually live by rules, uh, then it would just block that from coming in or being able to access a certain type of system. Now, all your OSs, um, with the modern OSs, you would have some kind of implementation with the firewall, like your Windows firewall. This allows you to do inbound and outbound, so you can set that up. Second, on the Mac OS, after 
the 10.6, so 10.6 and newer, um, you can have the application firewall configuration on that to be able to control. Also Linux, uh, there are different distros that use this kernel 2.4 or later. You would see that you can use NetFilter, um, which allows you to do packet filtering on the framework for for Linux systems. And some Linux distros actually have the the control uh, applications act, that would act as a firewall. Now, coming back to access control, the first step in access control is to identify the user and normally a company would do that by assigning the username um, and setting up the user account or the user tying to the user employee number the second step in access is to authenticate and the user would then need to submit <coughs> uh, some kind of credential that will be username and password or a PIN number or some kind of validation that they are a user in the network. So when using password, we know that we always want to use strong password, at least eight character, upper lower case, um, avoid using dictionary based words, and it should have some symbols so that way it will be complex. So more than eight characters, strong password, upper lower case, numbers and symbols, that's recommended. Multi-factor authentication, we need to know that these are the areas that we can implement, not just one, but be able to use different forms of authentication, like something you have that could be a smart card, like your ATM card. Um, and then using your ATM card, you need to have a PIN number, which is some your knowledge, something you know. And uh, let's say that you can also use your biometrics. That will be something you are, like your fingerprint or your facial recognition. And then it could be somewhere you are. That will be your geolocation. So um, if somebody is accessing your account from another country, then they would know that potentially that account has been hacked or um, it could be something you do that could be a type of action like a swipe or a signature you have to sign um, on a page so let's answer some of the questions in our assignment in question four it asks you what are what logical all-in-one solution is suitable for an organization that utilizes mobile device? We can use MDM software suite and policies to be able to manage, monitor, and control our mobile devices. And for number five, why is port management important in system security? We want to turn off the unused ports to make it harder for the attackers to find the stealthy access in the machine because if that port is open, potentially they can use that port to access your system or your network. For number six, I want you to search the internet for a firewall appliance for a small business that's gonna cost less than $1,000. I want you to note the brand, the feature of the firewall. So an example of this would be something like this right this is a uh, higher than a thousand dollars so we want to go with something that's a little bit less so you can see that firewall appliances are very expensive right but if we need to shop for something for the small business we can go for you can say We can go for something like this. Fortunate, this is a, for a small size business. Notice that it's going to support one WAN connection, four of the LAN or five of the LAN connection. And here it gives you the overall features. Okay. You can also go and look at the additional information. 
Fortunet is an, uh, also a good appliance to take a look at. <clears throat> and for a home business, we can even go for Firewalla. And Firewalla makes different type of firewall as well. Um, so you don't have to go with something from Cisco or something from Juniper, which can be very pricey. Cisco does make smaller appliances that will be more affordable for small business. Um, but you can see that there are many different types of <coughs> small business firewall. And so I can go with firewall of gold like this. This is a multiple functional type of device where it will be a router and a firewall in one um, and then it has some app interface and so on so depending on the type of protection and the feature that you want so you want something that's pretty solid for a small business because for an investment close to a thousand dollars we want to make sure that we want to be able to have some protection like using VPN, uh, having some of the, re, you know, improvement in performance, blocking certain things, how we were going to be able to control, and we want to be able to lock down and so on. So for that question, you can find one of the appliances that you like <clears throat> and examine the features and put down the information about that particular appliance. For seven, it asks you to provide an example of multi-factor authentication. So we can say we can use our smart card with a PIN number. So that would be something you have and something you know. So <clears throat> that would be ownership and knowledge. And then a fingerprint scanner and passphrase, that uh, characteristic and knowledge. And then a smartphone text or email URL and social security digits. So that will be something you know you have. So ownership and knowledge. Okay, so you can do something like that. And then there are other things like something your geo lo location and swipe. So that will be um, action, so location and action. <clears throat> so something where you are and, and what you do there. For question eight, why is email filtering important in network security? We want to prevent phishing attacks and spam and um, or spear phishing attack through email filtering and that's very important. So that brings us to the next part of our chapter. So in this section it talks about directory permissions. Those are just folder permissions. <clears throat> in that what you would see is that you can have permissions. So where do you really access through your permission? So let's say that this is your folder. Um, we can go back here and we can right click the folder. We would go to properties and we can go to the security tab. And here we would see that there are permissions <clears throat> for a certain set of user or group. And we can edit the permissions, right? We can remove someone from accessing that folder or we can reduce the permission or we can increase the permission control. So if it's <clears throat> for administrators and the user that has the highest permission access would be full control in Windows system. For the um, users that have the lowest, they would be having deny all the permissions. And then in that, you would see that they have read only lists. So to list the folder content, I can see, <clears throat> I can see what's inside the folder, read and execute, I can view and run e executable, like exe file. Uh, modify would be that I would be able to change the file and save. Full control would be everything. 
green would be just view and right would be save. Now the difference between modify and write and that modify allows you to delete. So when you write you can save to the existing file and modify you can save to the existing file and also remove. So we want to make sure that we can control it based on what the user is should be allowed to do for that particular object like a file or a folder and when you put the file inside the folder um, it would inherit the folder permissions in that because the file is stored in a container which is a folder and the folder have if the folder will have more restricted permission it will go with the folder permissions of course because that's the container that stores that file um, for the next part is VPN VPN is virtual private network this is used to be able to secure our network connection so mostly for remote users or in the case where you're accessing public network and you don't want your your traffic to be seen now there are different types of VPNs we would say that each type would use different type of protocol so you often see that there will be point-to-point -point tunneling protocol your PTTP um, or layer 2 tunneling protocol using IPSEC which is slightly slower than PPTP but it is more secure then the tunneling refers to the practice of encrypting the traffic so that way when someone's listening or trying to look at your traffic they won't be able to do that and the traffic would they be the communication between the system and the server um, and PPTP uses 128-bit encryption whereas L2TP would use would use 256-bit encryption and currently we're using AES then you do have open VPN which is more on the web base where you would see this when you have subscription for VPN that would use SSL TLS um, and you just authenticate to a website in which that once that's done it would be able to it, it will be able to encrypt your traffic with that session so your DLP is your data loss or leakage prevention this is normally like a, a way that we would be able to control how our data is going to be transmitting and how we would be able to protect the data from um, being stolen or taken from our company and some of it has to do with physical security like people cannot print a certain proprietary data and take it physically outside of the building you've probably seen this in some movies or others would be like attaching a certain document that would have social security number in an email uh, where it has personal identifiable information in that email so it will prevent that data from leaving the organization and then um, for the access control list we can use it with different areas it could be role based where it would be very user or group oriented or we can implement rules based where it would be very much like what we talked about with firewall rules um, we can control it down to the port the protocol and the services so email filtering is a way that we can implement higher security because a lot of the times um, threats can enter via email and data can be leaving via email um, in the case where if you have a user that's committing fraudulent that person can take design and files and things like that and be able to um, forward it to another entity so we want to be able to block that um, and we can look at the content on what is being sent uh, keywords um, destination um, and so on so anything that's external that could be uh, potentially harmful then we want it to hold that email for review and then before our mail server would then be able to forward it to the destination server so we can treat it as suspicious emails we can quarantine it and we would be able to control that now from a malware standpoint this can you know somebody can 
um, send a link and the user can click that link and be able to, to fish some information from our user, meaning that they can get the user to enter some information that would be personal or could be um, harmful to the company. So it might look like legitimate. Sometimes uh, also malware can come in as attachment. So we can have scans and blocks and filtering and content control with using email on the server end. But ultimately, like I said before, we have to make sure that our user is educated. Now, in spear phishing, that would just be targeting a certain group of users. So your, your C-level executives like your CIO, your CEO, and so on, uh, you know, in the case of spear phishing, they might have an embedded ad or an ad, a flyer, and then they would click on certain things to register for an event, and that would uh, entice them to enter some kind of personal information, and that might lead to the leakage of data and jeopardizing that uh, their identity across the web <clears throat> then your trusted software sources we need to check that so your apps that you use um, your os's that you use the vendor the certificates that's integrated with those apps we want to make sure that we check those digital certificates to make sure who is the publisher we wanted to not use uh, non-approved apps or non-validated apps and we want to make sure that there's trust with with the software sources the biggest rule in privilege in what the user can do on the system and the network will be applied to the principle of least privilege this would look at the least amount of access that they would have in order to access their system. So when we're looking at an employee, uh, for example, a receptionist, this person would then need a certain type of application, a certain type of system, and at the minimum level. So we want to only implement it at the minimum level. And then in the case where they need more, then we would allow them to submit a request for it and we would review this request and eventually grant them if it's absolutely necessary so you don't want to give them a lot of privileges where it would jeopardize the system so we want to make sure that least privilege allows us to control the resources for the user to function at the minimum level even though it seems very restrictive however it would control the risk and the negative risk that is and potentially um, we would be able to open up a little bit higher as is needed okay so case to case wireless authentication protocol when we're looking at wireless we have web we have wpa we have wpa2 and currently in your ac uh, devices you like your ac router at home and your smartphone connecting to it it uses 802.11ac which is the standard from ieee this uses the wpa2 and wpa2 integrate advanced encryption standard which is aes encryption it can uh, so in encryption we would have two areas one is the key lane and the other is going to be the encryption lane um, Encryption falls into two categories, either stream or block. And for AES, it is a block type of encryption. It is 128-bit, which is the encryption length. And it supports key length that would be in various size, 128, 192, and 256 bits. So the AES that you commonly see today is a 256-bit encryption algorithm. And so WPA2 is the strongest type of encryption uh, of a standard that we would be able to incorporate for authentication for our wireless technology now wpa3 is due to be released but it is not part of your comptia examination it is not fully integrated with our current technology so we will be looking out for the new uh, possible changes in authentication for our wireless now so 
Comparing TKIP to AES encryption, TKIP is like WEP, W-E-P, where we would uh, operate on the older hardware, which is lacking power. It's not considered secure, so the best is to use AES for security. And this is adopted with our government and also encryption standard. So some of the other areas that we can talk about is our remote authentication dial-in user service, which is known as RADIUS. This is when people used to dial-in to access the network in the 90s. Uh, RADIUS is being replaced with RAS, which is your remote access server. Um, as we don't really use the dial-up anymore, we are on the digital network, so uh, you would then be able to use your service provider network which is a digital network and to be able to go through the connection of the internet to be able to connect to your work network or your work system remotely so radius was more of a legacy system it this particular server would require authentication once the user dial in uh, put in the dial in number for their uh, your network system and be able to access. TACACS is Terminal Access Controller Access Controller System. This was expanded from 1980s and this is a way that we would be able to log on to the network from different to be able to access different resources. It does require re-authentication with the dial-up and it was slow and it does log uh, an individual in. However, <clears throat> the resources access was then somewhat limited. It creates a terminal session in that the user can control over a certain type of um, you know, desktop system. Cisco would use TACACS plus um, but TACAX was incorporated in the earlier technology. Now we would use remote access and VPN in order to connect in current days. These are some of the older technology, even when they're older, you still see them uh, being used in some of the network that has older equipment. Malware is malicious is includes malicious software uh, it's designed to jeopardize or cause damage to your system and malware can be a broad spectrum of different things uh, malware can be a ran it would include ransomware or spyware viruses worms trojan horses keylogger adware and other type of undesirable software uh, there are only about 50 to 50, 60% known malware in the wild, meaning overall the internet and the connectivity that we have nowadays to be able to access resources from one network to another. Um, in ransomware, it would encrypt the computer's file and mainly the storage drive and be able to ask for or demand a certain amount of money in order to release it usually it does not release the type of files um, this was famously known with WannaCry and uh, you know different type of locker based type of software so the best way to really uh, begin the combat with ransomware is to teach the user not to click the actual link that would be suspicious or unknown a lot of the times they would download a certain type of um, files um, that could be ransomware and that would lock their system and that can come from email or websites or link in sms or your text messages or embedded messages a trojan is a malware also known as trojan horse this is it's usually disguised um, in your common links and applications um, it could be a virus um, but usually it is a malware that's disguised so it would be masqueraded 
uh, using your typical common files. So the also another way to really teach a user is to really introduce them to different type of malware and how to be able to detect those. So the story behind that is that the soldiers, they hid in the Trojan horse as a gift and that's how they were able to invade the city. So the Trojan, it does, it uses social engineer to trick the user and thinking that, that the files of the application is what they commonly use and the user would then download it and it would cause issues on the system. Uh, Keylogger is a malware that record keystrokes and um, usually Keylogger would be delivered via a Trojan horse, phishing or fake email attachment. This allows um, the attacker to really re see what the user type, like passwords or some kind of identification that will allow them to access. Next is the rootkit. This is a set of hacking tools um, that would impact the operating system or the application, usually it impacted system file at the kernel and also OS at the kernel level. Rootkits, um, do key logging sometimes um, it also have complex type of uh, functions in that it would be able to damage systems um, at the lower level so in fixing rootkit it really depends on the type a lot of the times it requires the technician to wipe and reinstall the os um, or sometime having to run a script or code in order to fix that. So you would need to identify or use an application, an anti-malware application to recognize the rootkit and then be able to research that rootkit to see if there's any kind of solution for that particular rootkit. So they are a little bit harder to fix um, unless you wipe the system and possibly potentially lose some of the files that you have virus is would be it needs human intervention so the virus would then infect the system through the human action so they would entice the user to be able to click and download and run a certain thing um, now it needs a human assistance to do that compared to a worm where worm doesn't require the human intervention so we want to update your antivirus definitions and in the definitions there are a signature base and where it would look at a certain type of file and it would be you know identify those files as malware um, or it could be action based that would be heuristic where it would look at the type of actions or behavior of that particular file and be able to recognize it as a malware. Then we have botnet, <clears throat> which is a, a group of system that has been taken over by uh, hackers to be able to use it for attacks. And uh, those type of system would then be called bots or sometimes will be referred to as zombie. And botnet is then, and a lot of the times people don't know about the, that their system is being taken over. And it could be that, you know, they trick the user into clicking a link and it would download the file and then it would use the user, the, that system resources and, and the network to be able to launch a distributed denial of service attack against a certain type of system. A worm, as I mentioned, is that it would be able to self-replicate. It does not use, require the user intervention. A lot of the times, they would, it would come in uh, via uh, social engineering tactics, uh, through email, through websites, through downloads, uh, through embedded text messages or multimedia messages. So it is usually a lot of these malware would come in through human air so we want to make sure that people are aware of this and be able to protect the system uh, spyware it 
really snoop on the system activities based on the user, what type of access they have, what kind of uh, resources would be used on that system. And so we can use anti-malware to block the spyware. Um, a lot of the spyware is then used for advertisement purposes and or to be able to really track our activities and actions. So we can increase, by law now, all browsers require that you can uh, use privacy in that they don't record your activities and so on. And if we use that, um, sometime it would reduce the type of resources that you'll be able to access on the internet and so on, or some websites would be able to, to store a cookie and really trying to learn what you're using and what you're searching for and be able to market that to you. So in a way, it's kind of difficult to really navigate the internet nowadays, even though laws and are apply. Um, but they do have to give you options in opting out on advertisement, uh, your privacy. They have to notify you on the update of the rules um, in the type of services that they provide with social media and applications and so on. So we should use anti-malware applications. We should always have real-time protections, especially from the server end to really block infections, we need to do regular scans. Um, and especially when a system is infected, we need to disconnect it from the network. We want to update and frequently update or automatically update um, our system and our applications. Uh, we want to make sure that we control permissions to access of our resources and also the internet. We want to scan all downloaded files. We want to look at scan our sent and received emails. We want to uh, also control our ports and our services. Now, in the case where we would require recovery console because our system has is not functioning, then we would be able to make sure that we boot to the recovery partition. And in the case if it is infected, we want to make sure that we scan and update first before we actually recover. Uh, sometimes recovery doesn't always work out. So you want to be able to scan the files that you are pulling from that particular volume uh, before you put it back into the system. So and you know we can use virtual machines and um, isolated system to be able to do that or sandboxes and so we can create a, an environment where it, it is protected and it is isolated for backup um, in linux distros we can use a third party tool or we can use uh, something like tar to be able to do tape archive file tar command in mac os we can use time machine and they would have different type of utility depending on the version so backup utility is used and in windows environment you want to run your backup you can schedule your backup in linux you can do cron to do a schedule for backup uh, cron allows you to set up your date and time. This is a command that you can use in terminal to be able to set up your date and time. And I think I showed you this when we did Ubuntu lab. Now, earlier I mentioned that you need to educate your user. We can also implement firewall rules. Um, we can use application firewall and OS firewall. On your domain name service, your DNS, we can protect the records of the DNS and also use the DNS set, which allows us to secure um, our records for our DNS. We can configure our DNS um, information and make sure that we protect that. In social engineering and vulnerability, they can use it to fish to get you to give bogus website information. 
I described earlier about spear phishing. Um, they can also run scans against your network and be able to look at some of your activities and so on. So there are different ways for the attacker to really go through and, and um, trying to access the resources on the network. Um, there are passive and active scan in that some of the passive scan, uh, it doesn't record the actions in, in how that scan is used and what that scan is being ran from. And a lot of the scans that's being used um, in what you see in pen testing, uh, many of them are, are active scanners where it would be able to pinpoint which system is being scanning. Now, attacker can also impersonate someone um, to pretend to be a trusted individual or a system. Um, so the target trust and how we would establish that trust can be important. So sensitive information should not be disclosed. That trust needs to be established from system to system, and that can be done via uh, <clears throat> certificated encryption. So now they can also physically shoulder surf. We can teach the user to really not disclose the information when they type in um, and use screen privacy. Then we can also protect tailgating by, we talked about earlier, by using man trap, by teaching the user not to allow other people in following them into the building um, or following them into different facility part of the facility. Dumpster diving is also common where they would go through the trash to look for printed records um, information and to be able to use that. So we want to shred and we want to also use uh, services to be able to do that. We don't dispose electronic components without properly punching holes through them or properly shredding the electronic equipment, especially when we're using SD cards, hard drives, and so on. For the attack, we have denial, denial of services attack or distributed denial of services attack. So distributed is many system targeting one, where denial of service is going to be one targeting another system. Um, often you will see this with web servers where we would have a group of system would attack that one server and making it so busy that it can't respond to its regular um, clients and it could be caused from flooding um, in requests or ping and so on. So there are many different types of DDoS and DOS. Um, then we have zero day, and zero day is it uses the known vulnerability to a certain software or a flaw for that software. And so before the company could create a patch, the attacker would then be able to use it to exploit the, the system that's using that software. And there have been known cases for that. Uh, man in the middle is where they would intercept by listening in on the traffic to when they look at the endpoints one system connecting to another could be a client to a server and then intercept the traffic and impersonate the client system or the server system. So usually man in the middle is used with another form of attack. It could be um, that they use it with impersonation and uh, or cross-site scripting and so on. So you often see that this is being used with another form of attack. Brute force is how they would be able to crack password, uh, tried and true, um, using different type of characters and so on. And so the way that we can prevent brute force is to use account policy to lock down the passwords, to lock down uh, you know, the, the number of tries that they will be able to use to use complex or password policy and password history and so on. So um, now we can have a timeout where we will be able to buy ourselves time and be able to 
make them wait and look at what's happening through our logs. For a dictionary attack, it uses the common dictionary that can be found on the, in, the internet in different languages and be able to cross-reference uh, what's in the dictionary words, common words, to known passwords or possible tried with the password. Then you have rainbow attack in that it would use very similar to what you see with the brute force and it would mathematically uh, take less time in using table, uh, their pre-computed table, to be able to crack the hashes, which is used to protect the password. So rainbow attack allows the attacker to be able to, to crack it faster. Spoofing is a general term for a malware uh, to create trust by using IP that would be trusted or MAC address that would be trusted or computer name that would be trusted and that can be obtained through phishing or spear phishing or rogue virus program uh, to spoof and spoof is just to fake the trust. Non-compliant system, uh, the manager or the administrator is required to look at the non-compliant system, system that is not up to date, that needs patching, uh, that would, might have vulnerabilities, potentially could uh, create risk in the network. Earlier we talked about zombie or botnet. These are computers that have been taken over by using program or malware distribution for different form of attacks, especially DDoS or distributed denial of service attack. And so in operating system security, we want to take, make sure that we manage the user, manage the policy with the user, applying group policy to control the user in the membership of the group. We want to control share and files or directory folder permissions using NTFS. We can also implement encryption of drives using BitLocker or EFS in the encryption file system. We want to make sure that we manage what type of folders and files that are shared to prevent data leakage. Um, and then also audit and review the file systems and folders uh, that is being used. Then your user authentication Managing access is important, teaching the user how to use strong passwords, how to not share password, how to be able to protect their privacy and prevent themselves from getting social engineered or getting fished. And also uh, run most of our configurations through a different type of user instead of using the default administrator change the default administrator password and account information using in cryptography technology like BitLocker, EFS, and so on. For your security best practices, we want to use strong password. We want to implement password in your EFI or BIOS because that's where your configuration, your basic input and output for your hardware level um, is at. Putting in expiration for your password, implement password policy, control permissions and privileges in your system and network, manage your users and group like what we talked about, disable auto run and auto play on the system, um, use encryption for sensitive data, managing your update and patches, making sure that's regularly done using anti-malware. For your mobile devices, we would use screen lock, implement remote wipes, use locator applications, use remote backup applications, anti-malware update and patch OS, use biometric authentication, so we should have multi-factor authentication, use data and cryptography program, use authenticator app, establish trust with software sources and only use trusted sources. We would apply firewall uh, rules, to filter the connectivity and the usage and the service. We would implement user policy and be able to write policy, um, update policy regularly to really be relevant to the technology that we use. And for our data and device disposal, we want to make sure that we shred our device and data or printed data um, 
we can use drill and hammer to remove the hard disk and destroy the platter so that way it can't the data cannot be recovered or degaussing what's called electromagnetic uh, there are tools that will be able to do that now for the recycling devices we want to low level format and we can use standard format you can low level format by using the application to zero out all your data on the disk um, so we can we can create a physical infrastructure for the data to be stored on the disk to perform manufacture uh, low level formatting then we can overwrite the disk by using maintenance program to use the zeros uh, on the disk and we can do drive wipe in that we would completely deconstruct uh, the retrievable data on the storage right so in some of the departments the agency they require seven passes uh, using peter gutman 35 pass maximum security method so in that there's it's harder to really retrieve pieces of data or fragmented data that will be left because your data is dynamically writing so even sometime if one pass or two pass you might still have some pieces of data um, with flash technology, it, you know, there's some fragment of data, even though, you know, you reset things. All that is is to make the storage available again. The data is still there until it's written over. So overwriting the data, sometimes you still have to do three, five, or seven or more passes. So that's important to know. So to answer the rest of the questions here, <coughs> um, for number nine, to identify three or more types of malware, that would be ransomware, Trojan keylogger, virus. The type of solutions that's necessary to combat the malware, we would use anti-malware application to do real-time protection to block infection, periodic scans for known and suspected threats, automatic update on frequent usual daily basis, renewable subscriptions uh, to obtain updated threat signature, links to virus and threat in Sokovia, so update the file system, permission-based access to the internet, scan and download files for send and receive email. And we also need to train the user and limit use of USB external storage in the organization. What are some of the common social engineering tactics they can fish where to get the user to disclose personal, private, or proprietary information. <clears throat> Spear phishing would be targeting a group of individuals, impersonation, pretend to be someone else, shoulder surfing, overlooking someone's shoulder for password or sensitive data, tailgating, follow someone into the building, uh, dumpster diving, looking through dumpster for sensitive information that was printed or uh, electronic devices that they could get data from. For question 12, what security measures are used to reduce risk for shoulder surfing? We can use privacy screen, we can use division of desk or systems uh, for workstations, and we can train employees. For 13, three or more form of system attack, we, we talked about denial of services or distributed denial of services in that multiple system can be attacking one system using uh, lots and lots of requests flooding uh, man in the middle would be intercepting listening and intercepting in on traffic spoofing creating false trust uh, and brute force tried and true in cracking password Dictionary, plugging in dictionary based common words for passwords or passphrase. Three forms of security best practices. Uh, we should use strong complex password. We should use multiple uh, authentication methods. We would use, we would manage folder file permission. We would manage privileges and group membership for user account. We would disable auto run. 
we would update policy and so there are so many more and you can reference the the notes for 15 what do you do to secure mobile devices we talked about screen lock implement remote wipe to prevent data loss use locator application uh, use remote backup to be able to back up data use anti-malware on your mobile devices update and patch os use biometric authentication use data encryption program use authenticator app establish trust software sources use firewall implement user policy and procedure and train your users 16 how should you should an organization dispose mobile devices when they are no longer in use we can use shredding technique drilling or degaussing and there are companies that also can provide that type of service so we can contract that to the service or we can purchase the equipment to properly do that for our last question 17 what should you do to recycle your system devices we would do low level format of storage devices we can overwrite storage devices and we can wipe mass storage devices and we wanted to do it with seven or more passes and this concludes my chapter seven for cis 25 lecture thank you for watching the video and i hope i help you with your assignment